Then and Now, presented by the SFC Center for Dialogue. So I'm personally very excited and honored to be your MC for this special event. I was asked just yesterday as the original moderator was Shauna Sylvester, but she's experienced some personal tragedy uh, in her family. Uh, but I'd like to acknowledge her efforts as well as the efforts of city staff and the Center for Dialogue in hoping to make this event happen this evening. So before we start, some quick housekeeping notes. If you need to go to the washroom, head out the back doors, and they're out the hallway and down to the left. Feel free to tweet away. The hashtag is 2 mayors YVR. Uh, makes me think of between two ferns, uh, Galifianakis, uh, a little bit there, but please turn off the ringers on your cell phones. So looking at this crowd, there's probably a lot of uh, 80s greatest hits that we don't want to have interrupted the conversation. <laughs> so please note that this event is being recorded. Uh, if you do not want to be recorded, please, we've got two staff members here, just kind of let them know, flag it for them, and we'll make sure that you're not on camera. And uh, so, I'm glad you're here, and let's talk about what this event is all about. So this year, the city is recognizing not only a former mayor of Vancouver, but someone who has had a great impact on the city. Mike Harcourt was recently awarded the city's highest honor, the Freedom of the City Award. In its 81-year history, it has been bestowed only upon a handful of individuals, all of whom have made a lasting impression on the city of Vancouver. Those include folks like David Suzuki, Margaret Mitchell, Arthur Erickson, former Prime Minister William Mackenzie King, and Bill Reed, just to name a few. Recipients must be unanimously selected by city councillors, and we all know that a unanimous agreement in council is a monumentous uh, feat, so congratulations there. Uh, and perhaps, <laughs> perhaps the most intriguing part I found in receiving this award is that the recipients are granted free parking. Yes. <laughs> opportunity to hear from two of BC's esteemed politicians and a rare chance for you to learn about maybe some of the possibly untold stories from the men who have led Vancouver through, I would argue, two of its most transformative periods. Uh, from Mike's work as a community organizer against freeway expansion in Vancouver through his years as mayor, to his current work as an advocate for new transportation initiatives, Mike has had his finger on the pulse of key debates for the last 40 years. This is an opportunity for Mike to reminisce on um, some of the current issues of the city and some of his little known stories. And this also provides an opportunity for uh, Mayor Gregor Robertson to comment on the lasting legacy of some of Mike's time and illustrate some of the work the city is currently underway doing to address some of these issues. So first we're gonna hear from the mayors. Uh, I've got some questions to move the conversation along, but it's really meant to be a dialogue between the two of you, so please feel free to interrupt each other and, and uh, disagree or agree uh, velvetly. Um, and then towards the end of the conversation, we're actually going to open up the floor to take some questions from the audience. I'm going to remind you again, but I'll just mention it here. Um, please keep your questions concise and framed in the form of a question. Uh, the shorter your questions are, the more questions we can take. Uh, and we're going to try and wrap up by 7 o'clock. So, not that either of these folks need an introduction, I would do a quick introduction. Mike Harcourt is an exemplary activist, politician, and community builder. In 1973, Mike began over two decades of public service as a Vancouver City Councillor before serving as the 39th Mayor of Vancouver from 1980 to 1986 then moving into provincial politics and serving as our 30th Premier of British Columbia. Mike's exceptional dedication to building better communities has earned him such honors as the Woodrow Wilson Award for Public <laughs> Service, the Canadian Urban Institute's Jane Jacobs Lifetime Achievement Award, and, of course, an Order of Canada. Please welcome... In November 2014, Mayor Gregor Robertson was elected to a third term as Mayor of Vancouver. During his time in office, Mayor Robertson has dedicated himself to moving our city forward on priorities including improving public transit, working to end street homelessness, creating affordable housing, and making Vancouver the greenest city in the world. Please join me. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you 
both for being here with us tonight. It's a real treat. So I thought we'd start with having you both share a little bit about your story of what brought you to the world of politics. Gregor, you came from a business background, and Mike, you came from a lawyer-turned-activist background. How did your worldviews at the time shape your decision, and were there key issues or people that inspired you to throw your hat in the ring? So we'll start with you, Mike. Oh, okay. the key people would be Tommy Douglas, mm -hmm. uh, of course, uh, who uh, inspired me actually to start thinking about politics when I was a CPR dining car waiter. Uh, and for eight years I did that. We traveled across uh, this great country from Vancouver to uh, Winnipeg and then down into Thief River Falls, Minnesota, back to Vancouver three times a month. And I met him uh, one time coming. Uh, back to his writing, he was then, uh, I think, the MD for uh, Nanaimo and the Islands. And he got me thinking about politics. And, uh, and then when I became a lawyer and setting up the storefront uh, law offices throughout the city to give free legal advice to about 10,000 people uh, a year, volunteer lawyers and, and law students, uh, about six months into setting that all up uh, in 1970 or so, uh, I was visited by uh, Shirley Chan, who became my chief of staff when I became mayor, and Darlene Nazari, who was an employee of the city as a social planner. Uh, very disloyal, thank God, <laughs> as a city employee who was appalled at her job, which was to basically tell the people in Chinatown and Strathcona and across the east side of the city that it was good for them to have their houses expropriated and their businesses ruined so that a freeway could be built. And then all those neighborhoods turned uh, into public housing. So they uh, both approached me. Uh, Shirley's family owned uh, a business on Penn Street and they had a house on Keeper uh, in Strathcona. And they asked if uh, I would be willing to be their lawyer, the lawyer for the people, uh, the, the Chinatown merchants, and spoke at the Strathcona Property Owners and Tennis Association. And I said, uh, sure, who are we taking on? They said, oh, well, don't worry about it. <laughs> I said, no, 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 who are we taking on? They said, well, the city, the province, the federal government, the downtown business community, the development community, the banking community, the oil and gas industry, the car industry. Other than that, don't worry about it. <laughs> uh, and I said, well, what, what is it you want to do? And they said, well, we want to stop a freeway. Oh, you mean that freeway that, that the council wants to build along the waterfront? Now, how many of you have been to Seattle? And you've seen Alaska Way? <laughs> Can you imagine Alaska Way, a long Stanley Park, elevated, along our central waterfront, wiping out gas down in Chinatown, eight lanes right through Strathcona, Gravity Woodlands, and Eastern Sunrise, tearing down all those fine old houses and replacing them with Raymer housing projects. That was the idea. I mean, I shudder to think that uh, that could have gone ahead. So we, you know, being naive and, okay, sure, we can stop that. Uh, teamed up with uh, Jane Jacobs in Toronto and two future mayors in Toronto, uh, David Crombie, the tiny perfect mayor, and uh, John Sewell, because the city council there had the same dumb idea, which was to extend the Spadina Freeway uh, through Jane Jacobs to Fancourt neighborhood. Yeah, he, he, uh, you know about Jane Jacobs? Yeah. She who defeated Robert Moses, <laughs> who was the commissioner in New York City. Absolutely ruthless man. And she took him on and uh, whipped him a number of times. Moved to Toronto so her kids wouldn't have to uh, fight in the Vietnamese War. And all of a sudden got this issue dumped in her lap. So we teamed up. And we basically stopped the freeways and got the federal government, the minister at the time, uh, Paul Hellyer, uh, through a telegram that we drafted for 
him to send out that was uh, sent by two young aides at the time, Lloyd Axworthy <laughs> and uh, Dan Jordan. Um, we sent it back to him, and he said, okay, I'll send this out. And it basically was very simple. It said, stop all order renewal in Canada, period. So what then happened after we were able to stop urban renewal is to start a whole different way of doing cities. The livable city concept came to the fore. Walter Hardwick, uh, who was a council member of world famous urban geography at UBC, uh, started the idea that cities should be places you want to live in and work in and play in. And you should have a complete community. And you shouldn't have a 9 to 5 uh, downtown that dies uh, at 5 o'clock. Um, and people get in their cars and get in a, go on a freeway out to the suburbs. So we were able to change the whole idea of the national government's involvement, the province's involvement, the city's involvement in cities, and to engage citizens to be uh, part of the solution of planning the future of the city and their communities. And Vancouver, Stratcona, Chinatown, and the Fancourt area in Toronto became the two pilot projects that then led to that being extended throughout the whole of Canada, which led to the revitalization of intercity uh, Montreal, uh, Halifax, and many other uh, Canadian cities. So because Vancouver would march to a different grammar, and our citizens just said, hell no, we're not going to accept this conventional wisdom. And it was broad based, and it was, uh, had a lot of support right across the political spectrum. Because of that, we stopped that dumb idea. And we're the only major city in North America, think about it, the only major city in North America that doesn't have a freeway going through it. Yeah. <laughs> and, and what we have in, in this, in this uh, city, and very will tell you this, because you sure know people's opinions in this town. Uh, <laughs> Is, is we have a, uh, a city that you do want to live in. Now, we've got a few problems we've got to solve, like affordable housing, child care, <laughs> finish the transportation system, uh, make sure students aren't burdened down for life with indentured post-secondary uh, debt, and you know, there's a few other issues like that. But, but that long-term view and a courageous citizen is really what this, this, this city is about. And if you think about it, the first decision, I'll close with this, the first decision of the first city council in 1886, guess what it was? It was to ask the federal government for a marine reserve, a naval reserve, called Stanley Park. So, you know, there's, there's always been that instinct, that willingness to look ahead decades and generations to what could be done. What, and, and just, you, you look at that start with Stanley Park, we now have a walkway that goes all the way around uh, the Burrard Inlet waterfront and through Coal Harbor and around Stanley Park and around English Bay and I remember expropriating a few of the uh, rooming houses, hotels on the water side of English Bay and then around False Creek and the two Indian reserves that are now uh, Vanier Park and Kitsilano Park. And of course, we asked the federal government in the 70s for the Jericho Seaplane Base, which became Jericho Park, and extended beyond that into the Carnal and, and, and Spanish Banks. And now finishing, I think you're getting a little static for it, Gregor, but uh, <laughs> now finishing the last part of a continuous 28 kilometer public access on our waterfront, which is the Point Grey Road part of that. So that long-term vision, that long-term view of our citizens and councils is a, one of the reasons that we're one of the uh, most livable cities in the world.